Can you all hear me okay? All right, we're at two after, and I think we should get started. We have an exciting agenda today. Um, it's great to be here. My name is Meg Jamison. I'm the Executive Director of the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network, and I know plenty of you on the call today. This is our third webinar and fourth gathering of this amazing collaborative that we've started between SDN and SACE um, that is the Electrify the South Collaborative. Um, so we've convened local um, governments throughout the region to identify the challenges and solutions and enhance your ability to access federal funding for tra transportation electrification through Bill and IRA. We're focused on strengthening our peer connections across the region and equipping all of you with the knowledge and tools and resources that you need to apply for federal funding. I'm really pleased that we had the opportunity to join forces with SACE and do this this past year. Um, it's really allowed us to combine our strong network and technical skills to support you in this journey. Um, and we recognize that you're not only trying to develop a cultural shift in your communities around transportation electrification, but also the physical shift and actually implementing the work on the ground. Um, and so we have this great abundance of resources to support uh, the actual shift on the ground, but it can't be implemented without the leadership like you all are providing in your communities. So I just wanna say thank you for, for joining us today. I wanna welcome our new participants. We have a ton of new folks on the call. Um, and at this time, if you haven't already, um, change your name to uh, say who you are and the community that you represent. And if you could also put your name and city and county where you work and your role in the chat box, that would be great. It would help us understand who's on the line today. Um, we will share a particip uh, participant directory after the call um, and really look forward to, to welcoming you all and having a really robust conversation. Um, so here's what we're going to do today. We are going to focus on um, providing some really hands-on tools and resources, uh, and then we're going to have some peer uh, uh, connection time with some folks that you all might uh, find familiar. Um, Dory's going to walk us through some resources review with Michael Dexter from our team. Um, we're going to have a presentation from Sonia Mintzma, um, and then we're going to go into some conversation about IRA tax credits and CFI updates. Um, we'll hear from folks uh, in the city of New Orleans about how they've been able to use the drive tool, and then we'll talk with our friend Greg Sponseller and others about the charging station suitability analysis, and then we'll hear from EPRI, finally, at the end of the call. Um, thanks for getting up early with us, EPRI folks. Um, so really pleased about what we'll be able to discuss today. It'll be a whirlwind of, of good information. Um, but before we get started, let me pass it over to Dory to do some resources review. Great. Thanks, Meg. So um, I just wanted to make sure that we're all aware of all of the, um, the resources that we have for you and um, wanted to, I'm going to switch slides so I can actually show you. Um, we put together a, a directory of the participants that are working together so that you can reach out to one another. So if you would like to be, if you would not like to be added to that list, then let me know. Otherwise we'll assume that, um, that it's okay to share your contact information with your peers um, that are working in the space. And um, just wanted to show the website, we'll add um, your city or county to the, to the website. Also on the website, we list all um, and have recordings of all of the previous events so that you can, if you missed it, it'll be like, just like you were there um, and you can watch the video and, um, and take some learnings away from that way. Um, and then we also have a resources tab that has the slides. And so we'll be sharing the slides with you today and also um, links to um, funding resources and, um, and sustainability um, directors network resources as well. So um, with that, I will hand it over uh, and go back to the slides to Michael to oh, actually oh, got myself off track. <laughs> um, I did want to um, welcome Sonia Mayitsma and thank you for putting your pronunciation in your signature. Um, she is the new deployment um, manager with the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation who's gonna be engaging in the South. Um, so Julie Peacock, who had been working with us, has been reassigned to another region, but I did want to um, to welcome um, Sonia and have her, if you could pop on screen and, and just say hi and introduce yourself um, so that folks know who you are and how to connect with you. 
Yeah, thank you, Dory. Um, yes, yeah, so good morning, everyone. My name is Sonia Meinsma, and I'm with the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. Um, I am the lead for the Southeast Division One, so taking over for Julie Peacock, um, which includes the states of Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, and the territory of Puerto Rico. Um, and I'll be working alongside my colleague, Stephen Costa, who is the lead for the other southeastern states. Uh, so we are the technical assistance team for all of those southeastern states to help with any questions that you have regarding the BIL and IRA funding, including, but not limited to, uh, NEVI, CFI, the Joint Office FOAs, and other tools like the AFDC and more. So feel free to reach out to us at any time with any questions you may have about funding resources, requirements and rules and updates on your EV charging station deployment. So thanks for welcoming me and I am happy to be here and start working with all of you. Thank you, Sonia. Really appreciate you making time to hop on with us today. And I'm going to now go back to the slides and hand it over to Michael to talk about some federal funding updates. So let me put it back on slideshow. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Dory. And thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, that's a good uh, segue into a few different key federal funding updates at the moment. First of all, uh, we recognize that many of you in the Southeast did apply for the uh, recent charging fueling infrastructure opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, we know that was very competitive, upwards of 600 plus applications with, I believe, 47 awards. Uh, we were fortunate uh, to have four awards in the Southeast, many of which are uh, uh, organizations or local governments that participate in uh, not only this collaborative, but other activities with both SACE and SSDN. That being said, we know many of you uh, were also unsuccessful. The key here is that if you were unsuccessful or not selected, we do, really do uh, suggest requesting a debrief to cfigrants at dot.gov. Uh, this is something that uh, traditionally, anytime you apply for a federal grant uh, and you might not be selected, we always encourage this as it does help to provide insight into what uh, you might need to be able to strengthen for not only future iterations of this grant opportunity, but maybe even other grant opportunities in the future. So again, we do really uh, uh, recommend that you do that uh, if you had uh, applied for and were unsuccessful uh, in getting the CFI. Um, we do know that uh, DOT is uh, quite uh, burdened by the number of applications, and so it might take uh, some time for them to uh, not only respond, but be able to set up uh, a debriefing um, so just be cognizant of that um, as we look into the next round uh, that we're anticipating, again, from the outside, looking at uh, probably the April late April timeframe. Uh, I do also want to give a heads up on the IRA tax credits. Uh, first of all, we have seen that IRS and Treasury uh, has opened the pre-filing registration for the elective pay or direct pay uh, IRA tax credits. Uh, we have included resources to the pre-filing tools and other resources to provide better insight into how you might want to proceed. Uh, that being said, we also know there's still a lot of uncertainty. And one key uncertainty uh, that has been expressed by many of you is around the time frame. Uh, now, a reminder on these tax credits, uh, under statute, it basically uh, says that uh, projects in 2023 are eligible uh, to receive uh, the elected pay. Where the there is uh, sort of uncertainty at the moment is that under the interim guidance that we've seen, or under the current guidance that we have, uh, basically a fiscal year would have to start in 2023 for a project in 2023 to be eligible. Why this is problematic is that we know many of you all are on state uh, dictated uh, fiscal years. It might be a July to June, or even on the federal fiscal year, which might adversely impact your eligibility for receiving uh, elective pay for projects that may have been in calendar year uh, 2023, but were not necessarily within the eligible fiscal year, uh, according to IRS and Treasury. Um, now, we have heard, again, uh, that they are considering this at the moment, uh, that there might be a potential way in which IRS and Treasury can uh, write clarification of the guidance uh, to identify how a community might be able to still benefit from elective pay 
for projects in 2023, but we're not necessarily in that fiscal year. Uh, but again, we do not have full clarification on that just yet, uh, but we do want to at least raise that uh, for your awareness so that uh, you don't uh, lose hope in maybe a large uh, EV purchase or large uh, uh, renewable energy deployment in your uh, community that you really thought would have been qualified, uh, but was not based upon the time frame. Uh, we do, again, recommend you keep in touch, uh, not only with SACE, SSTN, we will try to provide updates as we get further clarification and as additional resources uh, are produced that can help better clarify how to uh, actually go and benefit from elective pay. Last but not least, I do want to give a quick update on some current and upcoming federal funding opportunities uh, that fit within the Electrify the South uh, idea. Um, we have uh, kept these up to date on SSDN's website. Uh, we have a grant opportunity database that not only includes the currently uh, available grants, but also includes the general timeframes in which we anticipate uh, future grants uh, as opening up. Uh, that funding announcement period is really based off of not only precedent, but also statutory requirements where they exist. Uh, but again, we do recognize that uh, the agencies are, uh, in many cases, overburdened at the moment, and so they're not always going to line up, uh, and it's not always going to be a definitive time frame. So uh, we urge you to take that with a grain of salt, uh, but still feel it is valuable in understanding the general time frame and landscape for when these federal funding opportunities are going to be available. Uh, we do want to just emphasize right now that we have the Federal Transit Administration's low to no emission bus program uh, available. This is a key opportunity for you to uh, and your communities to invest in electric or low emission bus fleet. Uh, this is one area that I will just uh, caution. We've actually seen a very interesting dynamic where, um, if I remember correctly, under statute, uh, there is a specific percentage requirement that it has to go from this program to both low emission buses as well as no emission buses. Uh, this is one of the interesting areas where uh, right now there's been such a deluge of no emission fully electric buses that they've uh, been unable to actually appropriate all the funds or obligate all the funds that they would otherwise like to in a given year. Uh, so in this case, uh, we do want to just uh, emphasize that there's opportunities to increase your competitiveness uh, but also look to see where uh, there are certain grant programs that might be undersubscribed versus oversubscribed. Uh, additionally, one of the key areas with the FTA Low to No Emission Bus Program uh, is the fleet tra uh, transition plan, uh, particularly uh, obviously for bus uh, buses and public transit uh, agencies. One of the things here you want to look at is that uh, NREL actually just came out with a great opportunity uh, to be provided technical assistance to develop your fleet transition plan. If any of you all are interested or considering that at the moment, this is a great opportunity to benefit from uh, federal technical assistance to advance your local uh, clean transportation and fleet transition plans. Uh, so again, we highly recommend signing up for that and benefiting from uh, that technical assistance. We also do want to mention that as of yesterday, the Safe Streets for All program from DOT opened up. Uh, again, while it might not have a direct connection uh, to electric vehicles, uh, it is certainly a, a close connection to safe streets and advancing a more sustainable transportation network. Uh, so we do want to just emphasize here the opportunities under Safe Streets for All, namely the planning grants, which have been uh, very undersubscribed. Uh, generally, uh, there was approximately 97% uh, acceptance of the last round of planning grants. Uh, so we do anticipate there being significant opportunities for communities to benefit for safe streets for all planning. This really goes to perpetuating the idea of Vision Zero and reducing the conflict between vehicles and pedestrians or those with uh, alternative mobility. So uh, again, great opportunity to better understand how everything from rails to trails, bus, uh, uh, tra public transit connectivity, uh, and alternate mobility uh, can fit in to help reduce the opportunity for uh, any mortality associated with vehicle collisions. I also do want to emphasize there's often, uh, opening soon are two great opportunities uh, that you all might be interested in. One of the key ones here is actually EPA's Clean Heavy Duty Program. This is one of the uh, sort of flagship 
Inflation Reduction Act investments uh, under EPA that is going towards clean heavy duty vehicles, uh, I believe class six and class seven. Uh, here, this right we anticipate at the moment, which again is only based on a request for information pushed out by the agency. It is not yet announced uh, as a uh, full eligibility, but we anticipate it going towards full electrification of class six and class seven uh, vehicles. So if you're looking at street sweepers, uh, if you're looking at uh, garbage trucks, uh, that sort of heavy duty equipment um, is a great opportunity to uh, look at because we anticipate, given just the sheer amount of funding available at the moment, this is might be one of those programs that might not have as much interest uh, given its overlap uh, with several other programs that are opening either now or in the future. Last but not least, I do want to just uh, point out that uh, DOE uh, pushed out late last year a notice of intent to issue a waste to energy for transportation and uses uh, grant opportunity. This is something that uh, we're still waiting on the formal announcement. It was anticipated to come again at the very end of uh, last year, but uh, has been delayed. We have not seen that just yet. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for those of you who might be, again, looking for uh, alternate uh, opportunities to invest in uh, fleet vehicles or other opportunities to repurpose uh, waste uh, for energy uses. Uh, that's really it at the moment. Happy to answer any questions, but also don't want to uh, take up too much time. I see there's a few comments, but I'll turn over uh, uh, back to Dory. Thank you again. Thanks, Michael. I see Eric, you've got your hand raised. Um, so Kyle, could you please unmute Eric so that he can ask his question? Hey there, Eric, can you, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Have there been any uh, on the waste of energy for transportation? That's really interesting for Chattanooga because we are we've been working with Volkswagen Diesel Mitigation Grant Program um, and uh, leaning into CNG slash RNG for our refuse trucks because right now fully electrified are um, about double what a diesel is, whereas it's maybe thirty percent more on a on a CNG. Um, but uh, so the, the clean heavy duty could be a very interesting pilot um, potentially to, to help, you know, just dip our toes into that one. But the waste to energy piece um, where our uh, regional wastewater treatment plant is working on new anaerobic digesters, well, the, they'll do gas capture and we'll have a, an RNG source there. Is that the kind of thing that sort of fits into that? And the idea being that the plant will produce you know, uh, you know, tenfold more at least gas than we need for our uh, refuse fleet. And so we could use those to drastically reduce our GHG if we take the credits for that. So then, of course, the plan itself monetizes it and uses it on site and all that good stuff. But that the, the idea is pairing a waste to energy project specifically with, with fleets. So is that, is that, would that fit in that box? Thanks, Eric. Uh, so quickly, I'll say with the waste to energy for transportation end uses, uh, based upon the information we have right now, which is from the notice of intent from DOE, uh, it doesn't specifically say whether uh, wastewater um, or, uh, would be eligible. It is uh, sort of assumed that it might be. Uh, the general focus of this was more on the solid waste, but obviously looking at uh, wastewater um, uh, components and solid waste generated from wastewater, uh, that would be uh, potentially eligible. Uh, we do have to wait, obviously, until the final announcement. But the other thing I'll mention on uh, this is that it is more going to be uh, what we uh, believe to be a planning grant. Uh, so we do not know the exact amounts available uh, just yet for the awards, uh, but we anticipate it to be uh, much more in the scale of planning rather than uh, maybe a demonstration or implementation project. Conversely, the Clean Heavy Duty Program this is something uh, that I don't remember the offhand, but um, it is hundreds of millions of dollars that uh, EPA has been provided under the Inflation Reduction Act, which depending upon, again, this uh, upcoming round uh, would certainly go towards toward significant investment uh, and conversion of uh, local 
uh, vehicles. So um, I do want to just point out the scale there, uh, but I believe that was the two main questions. If there was something else I missed, uh, apologies, please let me know. Yeah, no. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I'm going to actually, I'm sorry to cut you guys off, but just in the interest, um, if you guys would, I think yeah. it'd be great to take this conversation offline. And then um, we, there are a couple other questions that I want to get to before we have to move on. So um, thank you, Eric, for the question. Thank yeah. you, Michael, for the response. Heather um, Bollock had um, asked, are there any exclusions to the NRL fleet transition TA? And my understanding is that it's for um, school bus fleet or transit fleet, not, not light duty, correct, Michael? Correct. I uh, believe it's uh, meant to be complementary to the FTA's low to no emission. So it is primarily around uh, public transit. Um, I believe you're right that school bus may be eligible, but I do not believe uh, that it's intended for uh, light duty fleet. Excellent. And then Penny Radford is asking about the um, the heavy duty vehicle grant. Um, the name of it is just the clean heavy duty program. And the grants are linked. The programs are linked in the slides, which will go out. So you guys can go right to it. Um, and hopefully those will be out uh, by the end of today. That's my intent is to get the slides out by then. So, all right. So I'm going to move us along. Thank you guys um, to our next conversation, which is with um, Steph Wagner, who is the technical programs associate with the Electrification Coalition and Durbin Michener um, with the city of New Orleans um, to talk about their drive um, tool and the climate mayor's purchasing collaborative success. And we brought this um, topic to you guys today and also um, the next two presentations because we heard on the November call that you were interested in overcoming pitfalls to procuring vehicles and overcoming pitfalls to um, procuring charging infrastructure. So this is part of um, trying to, to answer that call. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Steph. I'm going to change um, slides to your slides. So give me just a second to do that, but go ahead and take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Dory. All right. To start first, we'll first talk about the drive tool and then we'll move into New Orleans experience with it. Then we'll go into the EV Purchasing Collaborative, which I'm sure most of you are already aware of, but as a refresher, it's always nice and for any new folks in the crowd. So in my experience, a working with the Electrification Coalition, a huge piece of transitioning a public fleet to electric is the business cases for it, which this tool can help create. Pretty much it helps with the examining what the total cost of ownership will look like in terms of what inputs you put, are you planning on going for like the any of the tax credits that are out or any incentives that are stateside, for example. And so that said, next slide, please. Thank you. So like I mentioned, it is a user friendly total cost of ownership tool for on road fleet vehicles with a lot of customizability over the years we've been able to really make it something that anyone with a fleet will be able to use, no matter what size of fleet. And ultimately, like shown in the figures I highlighted, there are more than that, trust me. And it shows the breakdown of the costs that are inputted in as well. So things like the insurance, maintenance, fuel, and anything else that you desire to put in. And going from there, you can also do long-term forecasting. So if not today, you plan on electrifying your fleet, what will it look like in say 2025 or 2030, for example? And the primary data inputs that you do for a preliminary look into what does it look like? What does DriveTool provide? Is the vehicle identification numbers or what comes with the unique numbers that comes with each and every vehicle, the annual vehicle miles traveled or VMT in this case, and the useful life or the uh, vehicle service life. So from the moment, the from the year the vehicle was made to the year that you plan on retiring it from your fleet. And so those are three basic ones that are three, pay, three required data points you'll need to run your fleet, but it is always helpful to include as much data as you possibly can. This is a secure thing where it's only on your laptop or your PC so that no data goes elsewhere. So that said, things like including what type of 
fuel pricing do you have? So say if you have uh, a contracted or stable price for your electric utility or your gasoline or diesel pricing, then that is great to include so that it is more tailored to your fleet. Next slide, please. And so we, to date, we from what we've seen, almost a million vehicles have been assessed from, from when we started tracking that number. And as you can see, we've added more and more features over time. We presented this so that it's something that is a tool for everyone to use free of cost. And where the EC is here to answer any and all questions, troubleshooting or otherwise. Next slide. And here's a nifty little QR code for if you're interested. It is on PC only, Windows only, so take that in mind. Um, but I will also mention here that we are developing Drive 2.0, which uh, I can share, Dory, the link for later on once that is live. But uh, being the manager of that project, it's going to be something that is beneficial for everyone. Uh, it includes a brand new feature, which is a whole tab dedicated to seeing what the cost of charging is, for example, and including those incentives as well. So if, you're, if you want and are interested in the drive tool today, there's a QR code and a snapshot of what that dashboard looks like when you are in the tool. So that said, next slide, I will turn it over to Durbin to talk about New Orleans experience with it. Thanks, Steph. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, in New Orleans, what we did is we probably used the drive tool in its in probably the two extreme ways in which you could use it. Um, you know, the first case was really just taking our VINs, using the assumptions that were pre-populated, and just loading them into the tool and just getting a sense of kind of what the numbers would look like and kind of that broader sense. And to give you a sense of the size of our fleet, which you may be wondering, you know, what can the tool actually handle? Our fleet is 2,900 vehicles so you know it easily handled and i even i think tried to break it at one point and i got bored at about four thousand. so uh it definitely did have the capacity uh to handle larger fleets and after playing with that a bit and after you know taking that and just to give you a sense of what we were trying to accomplish uh we were doing something a bit more than the total cost of ownership our mandate from the executive and from the city council was what they call the total total cost of compliance so for us, it was broader than ownership. It was about looking at, you know, people and additional headcount, training, policy changes. So what we ended up doing is creating our own Excel model to model all of that. And the drive tool became our principal third-party resource. So that was the place where we would go and we would upload our data. The VINs would get validated. We would then be able to take that data, look at some of the assumptions that came out of the drive tool, and then do a download from that tool to then put it into our secondary model and then change some assumptions and kind of go through that process while also doing stuff offline with our tool as it related to headcount, as it related to, you know, training of people costs and that sort of thing. So the tool was really vital in that sense in, in giving us a methodology that we could lean on in giving us, you know, a way to do this sort of volume upload and volume download and that sort of volume analysis. And as Steph said, I think one of the great strengths of the tool, it's actually a Microsoft Excel tool. So you're not uploading to some sort of website and you don't know where it's going. It stays on your computer, you can work on it and you can manipulate it. And it was just you know, a, a invaluable resource in being able to go through all of this material. And it also gave us a methodology that we could lean on and look at how EC had done and organized this tool and then maybe make some tweaks and changes here or there for what we felt were New Orleans uh, special cases and like little nuances uh, that we felt we needed to change. So very happy with it. Um, and we've continued to use it to do little refinements here and there. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Durbin. And uh, yeah, like, like he had mentioned, uh, it's useful for a variety of ways. We've seen folks use it a variety of ways over the years. And uh, there's with the full customizability of it, I'm sure it'll be helpful for you folks as well. So now we can turn our attention to the Climate Mirrors EV Purchasing Collaborative, which I the links will be in this presentation, but I will share it in this chat as well as time goes on. 
and happy to take questions about this after, but uh, we can move on to the next slide for now. So what it is, is something that we partner with along with Climate Mirrors, of course, Sourcewell, a government purchasing agency, the National Auto Fleet Group, which holds those vehicles as well as other groups. It is essentially a turnkey one-stop place to procure for any public US entities so that they can have, so they have equal access for competitively being able to bid for EVs and charging for structure, which should always be part of your planning. Next slide, please. So how it works is that with the collective buying power, you the collaborative is able to purchase fleets at a discount and essentially be able to hold that. So you don't have to wait for the order windows or anything of that sort that sporadically come up for various automakers I'm sure you've seen. And pretty much so long as you are a SourceWell member, you can check to see if you are. And then from there, you visit the National Auto Fleet Group's website to see what vehicles are available today and find the vehicle and receive a free quote for what the for what the price will look like for you. And then you can receive the order since, like I mentioned, the vehicles are held already. Next slide, please. And so what vehicles are available? Well, there's a variety of light duty available today. And I highlighted here the Escape, Lightning, Mach-E, and E-Transit. That is open today. And like with many things, order banks can close any day. So if you are, if it's opportunistic and you can do it that day, it's best to order, which pairs well with the drive tool perfectly since you can see that day what it will look like to electrify to those fleets, for example, to those vehicles, for example. And we have received word that folks ha that have already went through the purchasing, getting, getting the quote, they have received, for example, vehicles like the Mach-E under its baseline MSRP by about $1,000, which is monumental for especially a lot of the smaller cities we've worked with and towns, of course. They also offer a variety of medium and heavy duty EV automaker contacts, including school buses as well as contacts and discounts for EV charging infrastructure on their website. And I believe on the next slide, that should be the end of my presentation. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions if we go a little long, but I believe I left enough room for a little bit of questions. Uh, Thank you so much, Stefan. Durbin, um, really appreciate you, you guys both sharing what the product or what the, um, tools are, and then Durbin, your experience working with them. So does anybody have any questions for either Steph or for Durbin at this point? We've got a couple minutes. We can take some if you want to raise your hand or if you want to um, put it in the question and answer. Penny, go ahead. Uh, can we unmute Penny Redford, please? Hi, thanks so much. Um, I wanted to check as far as the EV charging stations, is there also a component for, um, what do I wanna say? Um, not just a purchase, but a service arrangement. So having the group come in and install and that kind of program instead of the city owning and maintaining it themselves. Yeah, so I believe under Climate Mayor's EV Purchasing Collaborative, they're used to, they don't specify that it has to be city owned. I'm sure you can find out more information on that or I can provide more if need be, but uh, depending on the network provider, it can range from, so there's popular ones like ChargePoint, Blink, EV Connect, ChargePoint being the one that is uh, FedRAMP certified, so you know it's good to go on the federal side. But uh, depending on the network provider, which are listed on the website, uh, installation should be covered and maintenance should be covered by all categories except for, I believe, one of them. And uh, I can provide that link after, after your comment. But um, yes, 
So that's all to say, definitely exploring what type of uh, ownership strategy you want to do is is uh, is in the cards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Greg, I see you've got your hand raised. Go yeah, for it. I wanted to ask Durbin, um, what some of the uh, like details were that you found in the drive tool that you wanted to modify to you know, speak more to the, the New Orleans case and then sort of what nuances uh, to your tool um, might be the most Im important that, you know, you, you sort of adapted the drive tool for? Well, I'd say it, it's interesting. The, the, the one that jumps to mind as far as an adaptation is, and, you know, we didn't take everything that we, that came out of the tool as gospel. You know, we would go back and look at it and see how it fit is that the city council seeks to purchase American branded automobiles and the drive tool provides the best vehicle based on fit, given its database and given what's been produced in that given year and what's the best match. And sometimes what pops up is not an American branded vehicle. And so what we would then do is go through that data and look at you know, the vehicles. And then I would make a judgment call based on, you know, it was, you know, seeking, you know, by looking inside of it, understanding that, okay, it was seeking this, but this seemed to be the second best case, or, you know, this was a comparable case, but it was, you know, a neg negligible difference, or this is going to be in this department versus that department. So maybe it should be this vehicle produced by this US OEM versus that one. So that was, the, that's the one thing that pops out. And that's just, I think, uh, you know, a nuance maybe to, I'm sure many other governments have similar um, you know, if not a written mandate, then certainly a practical mandate. So that's the main one that just pops to mind. Yep. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any in the question and answer. Um, I saw Heather asked for Durbin's um contact information, and that's in the chat. And then I'll also add it to the the newsletter, the email that goes out after today's call um, and add him to the directory as well. So as a reminder, if, if you hopped on after I had mentioned it, we we have a directory and the intent is definitely for you guys to be able to reach out with one another and um, ask each other questions and, and make sure that you um, are able to do that. So, um, all right. Don't see any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Meg to introduce Greg. All right. Sorry, let me get my camera back on. All right. Greg, longtime friend, coworker, colleague, SSDN member that's moved from city to city across the southeast, but still is driving progress on electric vehicles wherever he goes. I'm just kidding, Greg. It's so nice to have you here. <laughs> But the town of Holly Springs, um, really excited to have you present on all the work that you've done, both in Raleigh and Holly Springs. So excited to have you lead us in this next conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Sure. Thanks, Meg. Um, and hey, everybody, I'm going to share my screen and we will uh, pull this slide deck up. And can you all see this okay? Yes, sir. All right, super. So, um, yeah, I'm Greg Sponsler. I'm the sustainability coordinator in the town of Holly Springs today, uh, formerly with the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, where I was the energy and sustainability analyst. Um, and one of the things that I was, uh, I had the pleasure of working on when I was there uh, was a lot of transportation electrification work. And I'm going to share some information about this EBSE suitability analysis tool that we developed. Um, so I'm going to cover this transportation electrification study that we did, uh, which was sort of the impetus for the project, what the objective of this particular tool uh, is, and then I'll talk to you about how we sort of developed it and then how it's being used today. So to get started, um, back in it was like 2019, uh, we, we knew that there was a lot of uh, federal and state funding coming for transportation electrification. And the big one was like, oh, we got the VW settlement, which looks like peanuts now. Uh, but we know that we're going to be getting some money for uh, public charging stations. And it was like, well, where are we going to put them? 
And that conversation sort of grew and grew and ballooned into this uh, recognition that we need a lot more information about transportation electrification than just where are we going to put these charging stations. However, that is a, a significant part of it. So uh, my buddy Stan and a group of other individuals um, helped put this put together this transportation electrification study for the city of Raleigh. And there were like three dozen different uh, actions and strategies included in this. And, you know, predictably, one of them was uh, to position Raleigh to be aligned with the growing EV market, create an EV ready strategy that identifies locations for future charging stations. So it's like, where are we going to put these things? Um, and that was the, the big question, just where do we put EV charging stations and why do we put them there? And we're trying to overcome something like the image that you see on the right here. While I appreciate the effort, um, we should try to do a little bit better than that. Uh, so the the objective that we, we set forth to, to conquer was create a tool that can identify the most suitable priority locations for publicly available level two charging stations in the city. Now, I, I wanna make sure that I, I dwell on something for just a moment. It's level two charging, not DC fast charging. And this is going to be publicly available. It is not going to be uh, for private fleet vehicles or anything else. That was sort of the intent there. So what, uh, what we ended up doing uh, was we looked at certain criteria um, that would inform where a charging station should go. So we thought about EV driver behavior. We thought about location convenience, uh, how drivers are utilizing charging stations. Uh, we also wanted to consider economic development opportunities, environmental justice, and equity. So as we're unpacking all of these things, um, we we thought about where it was, where the charging stations would go and what it would look like. And we created this GIS tool that tells us where uh, where we think they should go. So this is sort of a spoiler alert to, you can think about this is the destination that we're getting to, but this is what the tool ultimately ended up looking like. And the darker uh, hexes are where uh, a location that is more suitable for station and then the lighter green uh, hexagons are going to be less suitable. But just keep this in, in your mind as we're thinking about how we actually got to that place. Um, and I, I do want to mention, uh, I know that Stan had told me that I think it was the city of Columbus, Ohio, hired INREX to do some spatial analysis study on where they should put EV charging stations. And they spent like $100,000 on this. And um, I think the 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 funny thing they got out of it was a local intuition of where charging stations should go. Uh, so I know in, in Raleigh, we've got a good idea, I think, of where they should go, um, but we didn't have any data to back it up, and we didn't have any real rhyme or reason to say that this place should get a charging station before this park or, you know, this building before that one. Uh, we know that certain council members were interested in having them in their districts. Uh, other council members were interested in having them in there. So we wanted to be able to put some numbers behind these. And that was another uh, sort of reason why we did this. But thinking about uh, the criteria that we were looking at, we, we thought about where people are at, which would be the trip origin, where people are going, which would be the destination that uh, they're sort of landing at, and then also the travel corridors they're using to get there. Um, and then considering the environmental justice and equity concerns, we thought about what are the effects on the environment? Uh, and so that we looked at air quality. And then what are the effects on disadvantaged populations? So we're thinking about low income and minority populations uh, and communities within Raleigh. So when we, we started developing this, we thought about, well, how can we put together a tool that's going to do this? And I didn't want to have to maintain a whole bunch of data sets. I didn't want to have to go out and uh, collect a bunch of data on this. So we wanted to use publicly available data sources. Um, as, as we were thinking about this, we also wanted uh, this to be able to be replicated by other local governments. So we didn't want to have to like, again, we didn't want to pay for it. We wanted to see if we could do it ourselves. But uh, you know, I, I'll also share that uh, since we developed this tool, I believe Knoxville, Tennessee has developed a similar version of this. Orange County, North Carolina has done this, and there's also some other research groups um, in North Carolina that have put these together for uh, local utilities. Um, and some of it has been based on this model. 
Uh, but we thought about like, we don't want to go out and create new data sets. We don't want to maintain data sets. So let's go with publicly available data that some expert is going to be updating throughout the sort of life of the data set. So that way we can continue to update the tool as conditions change. And again, we want to generate it through our existing sources because I don't need another thing to do. So the, the variables that we looked at that we thought spoke to the origin, destination, travel corridor, air quality, and then sort of disadvantaged populations. Uh, these were the sort of the variables that we thought uh, we could get data sets on and would also help us identify where the charging stations should be. Uh, and I, I want to go through these um, you know, right now just to, to make sure that we're, we're, we all have this sort of frame of reference. So we looked at population density census tracts, uh, POI layer one. So POI stands for point of interest. And this could be points of interest could be anything from a doctor's office to a theater to uh, you know, a big box store, to a restaurant, to a lab facility or a warehouse. Those are all points of interest that we were able to get through our own Department of Commerce's website. Uh, and we, we broke those out into more valuable and less valuable points of interest based on EV driver behavior. So POI layer one as being the most valuable could be a restaurant or a retail location, something that has amenities like restrooms, uh, food, it's well lit. Um, there's turnover that sort of works with how people are utilizing charging stations and then less valuable points of interest. You know, it, it may be that there's a quick turnover there. It's not open 24 seven. It's more of like a workplace. Like, so there's still value there, uh, but you know, we're not going to get as much valuable based on how people are utilizing charging stations than we would on the first point of interest layer. Uh, we also used average annual daily traffic counts to do both travel and you know the, the traffic counts, but then we also extrapolated that to consider air quality. Now, I don't have localized air quality sensors in Raleigh, so what we figured was, well, if you've got more vehicles traveling on a particular roadway, then you're going to have more tailpipe emissions, which is going to make air quality poor when we're thinking about uh, traffic. So we felt like if there were uh, higher volumes of average annual daily traffic, then the air quality is going to be poor and we would want to target charging stations in that particular area to help alleviate some of those tailpipe emissions. So we also looked at multi-unit dwellings. Uh, we considered interchange buffers, low-income census tracts. Uh, we did parking meter utilization uh, in the downtown area. We also used minority women business enterprises and uh, car ownership. So those are all like the dynamic layers that are going to inform the score that a particular area will get. Now, there were some static layers that we threw in there for our own planning purposes, and that included city facilities, uh, existing charging stations, and then also affordable housing. And those were just different layers that we wanted to add that don't have any bearing on where a charging station should go, but it's a point of reference for us because we wanna use those in our planning. Now, there were some additional considerations that I feel like we could have, we should have added, but we didn't have really good data associated with it or what we were going to be uh, able to pull. Um, it just wasn't terribly useful. Um, so the one of them was, is available utility grid capacity. Um, we just couldn't get that from our utility. Uh, but knowing that a particular area could does have like the electrical capacity to support a large bank of chargers, that'd be helpful. Um, but you know we'd have to call it after the fact uh, and see if that's going to be a a realistic location. Uh, walkability was another one that we we felt like we would like to incorporate, um, but it just didn't really work out the way that our GIS model um, was being created. Uh, existing charging station utilization. If we had uh, good data um, on the existing charging stations we had throughout the city, you know, it would have been nice to incorporate that because if we're thinking there's a charging station in this area, but it's underutilized, um, you know, maybe we don't add more charging stations in that area. But if we have an area that already has charging stations, it isn't necessarily that, oh, they've got charging stations in that part of town. We need to go somewhere else. It's like, if those are highly utilized, maybe we want to expand that bank of charging stations and add more because we know that those are being used. And then also there's the difference between the fast charging and the level two charging. And this is really only focused on that public level two. 
So with all of those different variables, we thought about which are the most important. And you, you may remember that like episode of The Office where uh, they're trying to figure out who should get raises and they're putting all the beans on different people's pictures. And we kind of felt like that, that's kind of what we were doing with these variables. So each percentage point is sort of like, well, we think that this is going to be more valuable than this uh, for our model. So like the point of interest, for example, layer one is going to have, um, it's going to be greater than layer three. So all of the variables that we incorporated are important, um, but some of them are going to be more important than others based on what we think EV drivers are going to do and how we want to address some of our council priorities. So I, I will readily admit that this is very subjective and it's not like a one plus one equals put your charging station here. Uh, we're just trying to get this close. Um, and it's going to be based on you know what the city of Raleigh's priorities were at the moment. And, you know, it could change based on uh, if you want to target more economic development or if you wanted to target more air quality or something like that, you could add additional um, percentage points to some of those other variables. So this is where we uh, we landed with the percentage points to get the, this is where we think a good charging state should go. Uh, population density, where the people are, are going to, that's going to be a, you know, a high percentage uh, but as we're going further and further down, you see that we've got different distributions, points of interest layer one is high, traffic count uh, is also high, air quality was very important. And then we have some of our environmental justice, equity, and then uh, some more kind of me mechanical, which in hindsight, I don't think really did as much as we thought it was going to do. But, uh, the, and the MWBEs, now those are still present with the business, uh, the businesses and the points of interest layers. However, we wanted to like lift them up a little bit more by adding four percentage points to those particular areas. So again, you can see sort of the distribution here um, in this nice pie chart, but we've got our public link active here and I'll share that in the chat um, and we can kick the tires on this uh, if we've got some time uh, at the end, but Wanted to share that with you. And then I also wanted to share, you know what, let me um, let me go back and I'm going to pull up this tool so that way we can take a look at it really quick. And Meg, can you let me know if you can see this? I can. Okay, so here is our tool. Now, we uh we started off and we thought about wanting to do it just you know we were just concerned about the city of raleigh uh but we know that transportation is not bound by our jurisdictional limits so um we felt like well maybe we could expand it out a little bit further and then we realized that all of the data sets that we were looking for were pretty much coming from a county or state level and it was really easy for us to just pull out what we wanted for the entire uh, the entirety of Wake County. So again, you can see in the darker areas, this is where uh, charging stations would be more suitable than the lighter areas. And we can zip into downtown and see, uh, we click on this hex grid and it'll give us the scores. So we've got this particular area has a score of 7.7. .7. This particular area has a score of 6.2. Uh, and this gives us a real number that we can then compare to another area. Uh, you can also see on this side, we have different layers. Uh, so this, um, if I turn this one on, we've got different city of Raleigh facilities. And we can now see where in, uh, in this map our, our facilities are going to be in the darker hexes. Now we can also look at existing EV chargers. And it's like, well, did we get it right before we even thought we had this tool? And it's like, yeah, actually we, we did a pretty decent job putting them where uh, we felt like the demand was going to be there. And that's the local intuition part of it. Uh, but you can also break out all of the different layers, uh, the points of interest, uh, you can do affordable housing, um, car ownership, and we can look at all of these different things. So in these different areas, you can break it out and view it in different ways. But ultimately, all of those different layers are going to, um, you know, aggregate together with that per those percentage points to give us this score of eight. Um, you can do different things with uh, 
do an eighth of a mile, quarter mile. Um, and then I'll also mention that in the tool, we have a methodology document that's sort of like our breadcrumbs on how we created it, uh, if you were interested in doing something similar here. So let me jump back to my slide deck. Uh, so one of the ways that the city was then able to use this tool uh, is we figured we want to go after some of this grant funding and we would like to uh, take advantage of the, the funding opportunities and support the public adoption of electric vehicles within the city. So we were able to identify every city facility that we own that is, uh, you know, within our, our map um, and then Every every city facility um, has a score basically based on where the facility is landing on our, our hex grid. Um, so you can see that this particular facility here, it has a suitability score of eight. And we can look at all of our different facilities. And you know, we, we have hundreds of facilities in Raleigh. And you know, we just took like the, the top 200, you know, anything that is uh, a score of 7.5 or higher, we're going to start thinking about now. And that's still a significant number of facilities. And then anything there, we start to winnow it down even further. It's like, does it have public parking? If it doesn't, then we're going to remove that from the list. If it's going to have a parking facility that's going to be renovated or modified within the next five years, uh, you know, let's pull that off the list because we can incorporate charging stations when we're doing that construction work. And we can continue to get the list smaller and smaller and smaller, and then have individual conversations with those facility managers or those departments to see where we should start to install uh, charging stations. And that was sort of where uh, the, the program, the project was when I left it to come to Holly Springs. Um, but you, know, you can see that this was the direction that they were moving in with a strategic plan initiative team. Uh, one other cool thing that we were able to do was put this in uh, Urban, which is another GIS-based tool that adds mass to different things. So you can actually see the physical buildings and you can kind of get eyes on the street uh, for where a particular area is. So again, it's only getting you close. It's not telling you at the intersection of Wilmington and Hargett, but it's going to tell you, you know, in this area, uh, this is what you want to do, uh, or you would want to put charging stations here, and this is where you want to start having conversations with private developers. You want to have conversations with your facility managers. Uh, you want to think about right of way and, and all of those different things to have more targeted conversations about where charging stations are going to go in your community. So that was... Uh, my uh, fun tool that I was able to develop in Raleigh with a uh, GIS staff member, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if we've got time. Awesome, Greg. Thank you for your presentation. Excellent as always. Um, anybody wants to raise their hand? I can help facilitate. I see somebody. Let's check on it. All right, Don Michelle. Hey. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hey, Greg, I just wanted to reach out and just give you kudos on that. Um, City of Knoxville has utilized that. I know you had worked with Brian. Let's go. All right. Thank <laughs> you, John. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. So it is an awesome tool. We had an opportunity uh, to work with that and also um, add a little bit to it uh, in regards to the ports, uh, points of interest and things like that. Yes, Raleigh is definitely different from Knoxville, but we had an opportunity to utilize it and, and layer it just the same. We took an, um, an opportunity to also layer the EJ tool opportunity zones uh, that was uh, very helpful in helping to apply for grants and uh, making sure that we were adjusting those uh, Justice 40 issues and LIDAC communities when we were doing that. I uh, I like what you did with the last piece as far as the density and additional build out and new development. That's that's an awesome way to capture that as well. But I just really wanted to give you a shout out on uh, uh, presenting that and also uh, giving Knoxville a chance to kind of take uh, what we learned from you and, uh, and apply it to our city city and our MSA. So thanks. Thanks a bunch for that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Don Michelle. That's awesome. Great to see how how this uh, love is spreading.
<clears throat> All right. Anybody else want to ask a question? We have a couple more minutes. If you don't ask a question, let's keep talking. That's right. Lori put something in the chat box. You're tempted that I, I might call on you. I see another person. Thanks for raising your hand, Penny. Can we unmute um, Penny Redford? Thanks, Greg. It's always great to see you presenting and I'm, I'm, it's always awesome. So, but my question is, and it may be Knoxville or one of the people that used your tool might be able to answer it better. Um, how long does it, did it take or should it take for you to be able to develop your own program? I mean, is it like, of course, it depends on how quickly you can get your data together. I get that. Um, but is it like plan on Six months, uh, you know, six weeks, what is it? Well, so I guess the the energy manager in me wants to say it depends, um, <laughs> but the, uh, so it, again, it depends. I, I think the, the worst thing was, is we agonized over how we were allocating those percentage points so much. And we did a ton of like peer review, basically, you know, I was asking Stan and I was asking our utility Duke Energy. I was asking a bunch of SSDN folks and all of the North Carolina SSDN members, like, does this make sense uh, for what you think, um, you know, the charging station utilization should be? Does this make the most suitable location for a charging station? And we got a lot of that feedback. We checked with all of our internal department heads, especially transportation, economic development. Does this make sense to you? And we did tweak it a little bit. Um, but I think making sure that we had that collective buy-in and we vetted that so it wasn't just this is what Greg thinks, um, that that really helped resonate with what our community thought um, we wanted to do with, with public charging. Uh, but I, you got to have a good GIS staff member. I could not have done this without um, you know, my friend Katie and our IT department. Uh, but you know, we did design this so that way other local governments could find you know, their Department of Commerce's website and they could use these different uh, data sets and replicate it in a way um, that like we created the skeleton already and you just need to put some flesh around it. Uh, and you know, that's that's what other local governments have been able to do. If if you're starting from scratch, I'd say, you know, at least two months, uh, three months, uh, knowing that you've got a bunch of other stuff going on. But, you know, Penny, I guess in local government, I always know that it takes twice as long as I expected to. So six is probably realistic. <laughs> if That's a big, long, circuitous way to say, yes, yeah, six. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder yeah. how much, how long it took for Nashville. Knoxville. For Don Michelle that just spoke. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, Don Michelle, if you could, um, you know, throw that in the chat. I know it's it varies place to place uh but you know it's uh it has been done and yeah. um you know, it, I think one of the things we did though we we were very lucky to have our GS folks down the hall uh they have all the resources all the mapping it's all there and uh just having that conversation and sitting with them it took a it took a about a month uh and then trying to decide what we thought were the points of interest and then still it, it, it just took some time, but we had a great partnership with our GIS folks and our, our planning folks here in-house. Well, cool, thank you. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> Excuse me, just a second. Um, <clears throat> so Greg, thank you so much for presenting. We are at time. Thank you for the good questions. I think we'll pop your contact info in the chat. Um, Dory is gonna pause us for a second and take a quick poll. If you remember our previous conversations, you know, we love a good feedback. Uh, opportunity. So Dory, take it away. All right. We actually have two questions and it should have just automatically popped up on your screen. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind answering um, these multiple choice questions and you can um, offer more than one choice. So getting kind of fancy today, uh, but the first question um, for the next virtual call, which we have scheduled for March 16th, if you could please indicate the topics that you're interested in. Um, and then the second question, if we're able to um, convene another in-person event like we did last September in Savannah, 
when would work best for you? So we're looking at January, February, or March um, in 2025. Already getting that far ahead in planning. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to share my screen um, so that we can, I can introduce our next speakers. And we're really fortunate to have both John Hollowell and Alan Zhao um, with the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, to talk about a really cool tool that they have um, that will help your um, quest for federally funded electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So I will go ahead and hand it over to, to Alan and to John and stop my share. Thank you guys so much for being here and taking time with us today. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Dorian team for inviting us. Uh, my name is Alan Zhao. I'm with electric, uh, the electric transportation team at EPRI and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, John Hollowell here. I'll get my slides going. Well, and while Alan's doing that, just real quick, if you're not familiar with EPRI, we're a, a, a nonprofit public research institute. We're primarily funded by utilities, but also uh, quite a bit of our funding comes from grants from state and federal agencies. And, and we've been working on this for a while. Alan's going to dive in and describe the tool. Uh, just to give you just a quick background, this came from conversations that started about four years ago now with other utilities where they were going through the process of developing qualified product lists. And it turns out it's a lot of work. Um, and we started thinking about from the EPI perspective as a public, re, you know, public good, you know, could we do some kind of a tool that would sort of help address this where we're not building a thousand qualified product lists? So, Alan, take it from there and, uh, and then we'll take questions at the end here. Thanks, John. Uh, if anyone would like to follow along today, this is a free to use public resource that we've developed. Uh, you can get to it at epri.com slash VPL. Uh, it'll point you to our web portal where you can find an Excel sheet, which is the how the resource kind of takes shape. Um, talking a little bit about background and process today and also how to start navigate, navigate using the list um, and some of our partners that we have on this list officially. Um, to give a little background, we are standing up this list of vetted products uh, for EBSE. It's a bit like the Wild West out there. You can go to Amazon and get an unbranded, unlisted charger. Uh, and it's a little dubious sometimes whether or not that particular piece of hardware would be safe. Uh, so we're starting to break through the fog a little bit and looking at a lot of industry oriented standards around electric vehicle hardware, uh, which takes the form of this vetted product list, which now has over 440 products with over 70 vendors on it. Uh, we cover over 100 different qualification criteria, but breaking up into buckets, what the most important ones are, you can see common things like uh, outdoor temperature ratings, whether a unit is Energy Star um, certified. Um, different kinds of communication protocols for the network on the, both the network and or the hardware and the software side. We also start breaking up into specific regional criteria. Um, some of our partners in California look at specifically uh, California spe state specific requirements, uh, but maybe most interesting to you all might be the Title 23 requirements. We look at verbatim the language from uh, the joint office about the NEBI uh, program to look at hardware side requirements, including things like Buy America. Um, and for our official partners on this list, we have sometimes custom qualification criteria, uh, such as data sharing agreements and other types of things that can't be covered by the rest of these buckets. Um, so John gave a little background into this, but just to recap this again, uh, we're finding a lot of benefit in standing up a resource like this on both the vendor, EVSE vendor side, and also the organizational side. Uh, for vendors, it's a little frustrating for them to look out uh, for dozens, if not hundreds, of individual qualified product lists, uh, many of these which have their own very intricate application processes and may also be uh, associated with individual fees. Uh, so standing up a more common resource like this, uh, we've seen a lot of value being generated there. Uh, on the organization side, we also see uh, it's very um, taxing in a way to stand up a qualified product list on your own. Um, it's hard to wade through the sea of different products out there and what they're capable of. Uh, and there's a lot of maintenance involved in keeping those lists updated. Uh, we're also seeing that there's very little industry convergence towards a common set of standards. Uh, so working with different utilities and other organizations, we're finding that um, even starting the conversation about a tool like this starts to push people towards 
what we see as what might be a recommended set of things to look out for in EVSE hardware. Uh, so a little bit background on process and how this works. Um, there's the web portal that I pointed out earlier, every.com slash VPL, where you can find where we host our updated resources. Um, from there, we put inputs from both the organizations and for the vendors. Uh, with the vendors, we work with them to see how to correctly uh, portray their different uh, models on this specific list. We work with them through a multi-week vetting process where we verify their certificates for specific standards and also work with them to submit an application and product information sheet. Uh, from there, we update that into the file uh, where organizations can use that, where they work with us to develop um, a set of criteria that they deem that are pertinent to their specific programs. So this takes the form of the Excel sheet that we mentioned earlier. Uh, this uh, resource gets updated roughly monthly on our web portal. So it's always live, it's continually updated. Uh, and we tend to add products basically with every update. So uh, the resource, the, the list of resources only grows from here. Um, so I'm here to start breaking down a little bit of how to use this resource. We understand it can be a little complicated. Uh, when you download the file itself, you're greeted with this giant matrix of uh, different <laughs> qualification um, uh, icons here. So start to break down how to interpret some of these icons and how to use this list for something that you might need uh, for your own programs. Uh, so to start off, we um, basically for each qualification criteria, we have a product criteria key. Um, so this will be for specific things like Energy Star for a specific product. Uh, for a green check mark, that's where you can see that we verified with the vendor, either through their attestation or their certificates that that specific product meets that specific criteria. Um, so you can be reassured that like that specific uh, criteria would be met. Uh, red X obviously means that it does not meet that specific criteria. Um, you'll sometimes see some caution marks, the yellow circles here. Uh, that's where we've inherited some product information from other external organizations. And we actively work with vendors to kind of eliminate those from our list to help you understand how that product uh, behaves with that specific criteria. And there are blank circles for if you have, uh, for example, a level two charger, um, some specific uh, criteria for DC fast chargers may not apply. So you'll see some empty um, boxes there for things that are not applicable. On the left, you'll find this smaller subset of a table. This is just basic product information. You'll find here uh, the brand and model number. Um, the type of charger, whether it's a level two AC charger or a DC fast charger. We've also included things like wireless chargers and DC fast chargers capable of V2G here. So you'll be able to sort by that type of resource. Uh, we also have max power in terms of kilowatts and whether or not that specific piece of hardware can interact with a network. Uh, and we also left spaces for vendor specific notes. So things like the port count, um, different connector types and what so what so forth. Uh, then we split these into the different buckets of criteria that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, we kind of group this by color to make it a little easier to understand. Um, and that follows the general buckets that I've mentioned, like EVSE, electrical criteria, physical, and networking, and so on and so forth. Um, at the bottom, you'll see that we've set up some different tabs. This is where we split into the specific approved product list for some of our official partners. Uh, you'll also see a NEVI tab there that's not officially sponsored by the joint office, but we have identified through our NEVI filters which products we see that are close to compliance with the NEVI program and also are in compliance with the NEVI program. So for our official partners, mostly utilities at the moment, uh, when you click into that specific tab, you'll find uh, what basically drills down into a more simplified approved product list. Uh, through interactions with these organizations, we work with them to identify uh, what exactly is needed in their programs. We'll set up a set of filters that start to uh, filter out the full list of uh, products there uh, to generate what would look like on the right, the, for example, Georgia Power approved product list. Uh, it's a little simpler, or easier to understand uh, for anyone that's using the list. We're also trying to be very transparent about what we're doing with uh, this product list. So you'll see here a specific tab called the qualification criteria list. Uh, in this tab, we disclose exactly what we're looking for with each criteria. 
uh, we draw the definitions um, for different language for different standards. And for things like NEBI, we also draw verbatim from program guidance what specifically we're looking for there. Uh, we also include notes about what we're expecting from EBSE vendors to provide us with, whether that's documentation or some other type of verification for that specific criteria. On the right, you'll also see our partner list, um, what specifically they want from their programs. Uh, so this also, for the sake of transparency, will disclose what goes into a filter to start filtering out different uh, pieces of hardware uh, for specific organizations, which then gets generated into the simplified list you saw earlier. Um, so all being said, who's using this list? Uh, who's uh, Who are we partnering with? Uh, we have a couple of utilities that we partner with uh, officially, um, a couple of the IOUs in California, but also Georgia Power Company. Uh, in conversation, we have Alabama Power Company also coming early this year, uh, in addition to about 10 other utilities, uh, and also spreading our reach to not only utilities, but external organizations such as state DOTs and other uh, NGOs. Uh, so that's basically an overview there of the vetted product list, and I'll open it up to questions now. Thank you so much, Alan and John. Um, in the in the comments um, section, there's a question from John Bonnet. He's asking, um, how are you scrutinizing Buy America compliance for this list? And then another question, sorry if you've said, but is there any cost to manufacturers or vendors to be reviewed for inclusion in the list? Sure. Uh, on the first question for Buy America compliance, we break it down into the different subsections for Buy America. We know that there are different timelines for uh, the steel manufacturing. We work there with vendors specifically to um, there's no certificate verification process for that one, but we do point vendors to the specific language for Buy America, and then they work with us to attest whether or not they're compliant with the different subsections there. Um, for the second question on cost, uh, looks like John already answered some of that, but I'll uh, also verbally reiterate. Uh, the cost is borne both through our program. Uh, we have an initiative within EPRI called EVs to Scale. We have funding set for this specific resource for another two years, but also part of the cost is borne by our vendors who apply to this list. Uh, there's a per product fee that we put on the vendor side so as part of our application, uh, which covers some of the cost of our labor uh, for vetting here. Uh, and there's no costs for organizations that are interested in using this list. Uh, so um, for both people who use this list, uh, kind of just as their own download and on the organizational side, we're trying to boost you know, visibility and adoption of this resource. So it's a free to use resource for organizations as well. I see a question in the Q&A about uh, our electrification conference coming up in Savannah. Um, I'll chat a link to that. Um, it's a conference where we look at electrification across both transportation, but we also include buildings and other areas. Um, um, I'm, I don't want to waste a lot of time here, but I'll chat a link and you can go out and take a look. The, the conference agenda and topics are posted there. Great, thank you so much. And then Greg um, <clears throat> Carlton has got his hand raised. So if we could unmute him so that he can ask his question. Yes, hey, thank you for putting together this list. Um, I, I think it's very helpful. I'm just curious, is there any estimated um, installation costs for these particular charging units available as part of this database? No, we're not really touching cost at the moment. Um, to Give a little more background we're mostly looking at hardware and not looking at field installation because we know okay. that uh, right. different variable. factors of yeah they're variable so we're not trying to put a finger on that right part. but I, I appreciate that you included just you know such a diversity of information in this database about federal compliance and things as well i think that's very helpful as we take a look at you know potentially partnering with these various charging providers or looking at these products so thank you And I just would emphasize, you know, we, people are using this list, you know, it's out there, it's public, you can use it as a resource, but we would love to know if you're using the list, let us know that, and it's particularly if you're willing to let us tell vendors that, because it's important to the vendors to know the list is being used by more than one entity. And we have the California IOUs using the list, and we're seeing that expand to other areas of the country. We're trying to onboard multiple utilities right now, and hopefully over the next few weeks, you'll see some new utility names appearing in the the use list. But if your organization wants to formally use it and have a tab in there, just let us know. We're happy to work with you. 
Thanks for that. I don't see any other hands raised. I did see a question just come in um, from Heather. Do we have any visibility on charger issues? Sure, I can take this one. Um, not within the context of this tool, but we do also have other public resources as part of this initiative that starts to look at charger reliability. Uh, Heather, if you send me a message, I can also point you to some of those resources. Great, thanks. And I don't see any other hands raised. <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions in the chat and give it another minute or so. Make sure that I'm checking the question and answer. Looks like we don't have any there either. All right, well then thank you so much, um, Alan and John for sharing your, your resource with us and sharing um, information about the upcoming conference and being with us here today. The folks got a lot of really good information out of it. And um, just turning it back over to general questions, we have about seven minutes before we officially wrap up. So if there was anything um, that anybody would like to to ask that didn't get a chance earlier or um, something not on topic. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Give me just a second, cause I can talk and chew gum at the same time um, to make sure that everybody is aware of our next call in May. So we are, there we go. It should be popping up now. Um, so if you would, please hold your calendars for our next call. Um, we're looking to do a virtual event May 16th, which is again a Thursday. Um, this time we're gonna switch it up and try morning um, time from 9.30 to 11 a.m. And we already have the registration link. Um, for some folks, I did go ahead and um, I just created a calendar event. Um, and I think that I will go ahead and do that again this time to to help remind folks um, that, that the uh, webinar is coming. And um, in the, the link, you still will need to register for the um, for the next call. So um, checking to see if there are any other comments now in the chat or any other hands raised. Randy, I see to include you in future webinars. Great. <laughs> um, Meg, I see you popped on. Do you have anything that you would like to, to add to close this out for today? I just wanted to say thank you. I thought this was super informative and I hope you all learned a lot. Um, just to remind those of you that are interested in attending the SSDN annual meeting, it is also coming up April 30th through May 3rd and we will continue to have electrification conversations both on transportation and buildings and all the things. So. Um, I'll put my email in the chat in case you have questions about that, but Julie just wanted to say thank you, Dory, Stan, Sace, and everybody else for presenting today. Thanks, and I would like to say thank you also to my colleague Kyle James, who's behind the scenes making all of the questions happen and all of the <laughs> uh, technical aspects work for us, so. All right, um, I'm not seeing anything else. So I guess we'll go ahead and stop and um, see y'all in May, if not sooner. And thank you again for taking time out of your day to, to come be with us and to create this um, community amongst yourselves. Hopefully um, you learned something. And again, the um, slides and um, email will be going out again with the directory so that you can also connect with each other offline as well. All right, take care. Thank you.